So our presentation is going to discuss which is Broom's disease. <laughs> and my name is Stephanie and I will be talking about the developmental process. Hi, I'm Mildred and I'll be talking about biological significance. And I'm Yasmin and I'll be talking about the mechanical processes. And to further to explore the developmental process, I'm going to explain what witch's Broom's disease is and its causes and effects. So what exactly is witch's Broom's disease? It's a disease that generally is found on shrubs or trees that cluster together to make multiple twigs collectively. Often they form a nest or a brush-like appearance as you can see in the two pictures to the right. Witch's Broom's disease can vary in appearance and plant type, but we commonly see it in Decadus trees like the cacao tree. So a little fun fact, witch's broom's disease got its name because it was thought to be a product of witchcraft. The masses that are developed on the trees and plant were believed to resemble a witch's broom. This led to speculation that the trees with the disease were likely a place where witches retreated. So causes of witch's broom's disease is a little complex, but to understand it, we have to understand that normal plants are expected to produce auxin, the hormone, in their leading shoots to prevent secondary and tertiary overgrowth, known as apical dominance. However, when a plant uh, gets witch's broom's disease, it's usually because infection is introduced through phytoplasmas or bacterial parasites, fungi, insects, nematodes, and viruses, including other things that can promote genetic mutation and cytokinin leading to plant stress. Cytokinin and genetic mutation interfere with normal plant growth by allowing the cells to undergo proliferation of the shoots with small internodes that form mutated twig-like masses. And cytokinin buildup, as opposed to auxin, results in a loss of apical dominance, which triggers the witch's broom's disease to form. So this affects the plant because cytokinin will increase the amount of shoots to form, giving rise to an increase of secondary shoot development. Furthermore, this leads to an overgrowth and deformed and irregular clusters of shoots in random directions and further develops witch's broom's disease on the plant. And so some of the plants that are very affected by this is our, infamous, or our famous cacao tree. Um, the cacao tree is where we get our chocolate, so our chocolate may be at risk. On our left, we see a healthy plant and we can see that it maintains apical dominance. We don't see any extra growth, however, to our right, we see our affected plant. And we can tell that this plant is starting to somewhat grow um, shoots. And this is because of loss of apical dominance in the cacao tree. Why is it important that we learn about witch's broom disease? Cocoa witch's broom disease caused by the Cidiomycete fungus, Cornipolis perniciosa, is one of the most important diseases of cocoa in Latin America and the Caribbean islands, causing large scale losses. In Brazil, it is found throughout the Amazon basin and in southern Bahia, where it is one of the most destructive diseases of this crab. So it wiped out the whole farms, and in the 1980s, the disease devastated the Brazil's cocoa production. Which is disease symptoms on cocoa? So if you look at figure A, you can see that cocoa tree with a high number of terminal and lateral blooms showing a burn aspect. At on figure C, you can see infected flower cushion with lateral green blooms. And at figure E, you have dead broom with necrotic leaves and basidial carps and an older dead broom. And if you look at figure F, you have pulpinous and pitial swelling. And at figure H, you have cocoa pod with witch's broom induced necrosis. And at figure I, you have internal symptoms of witch's broom and pods, followed by basidial carps and dead broom and pods. Infected tissues suffer accelerated senescence and necrosis upon transition to the secondary dicaryotic mycelium with clamp connections producing dead rooms and pods or basidial carps are formed. When a living organism cells or tissue die, the condition is called necrosis. It causes leaves, stems, and other parts to darken and wilt. Leaf senescence allows the degradation of the nutrients that are produced during the growth phase of the leaf and there were distribution to developing seeds or other parts of the plant. Pitials and pulvinite may also suffer hyperplasia and hypertrophy. It is common to observe lateral botting of vegetative brooms as a result of loss of apical dominance. Hyperplasia is the abnormal increase in number of cells. Hypertrophy is excessive growth 
due to the enlargement of the individual cells. The hormone imbalances promoted by the pathogen keep soluble sugars available in the APO plus, but when the supply decreases, the fungus promotes plant cell death and accelerates senescence, producing the dry bloom, where it survives and defends itself against competitors with toxins and secondary metabolites. The fungus diverts the plant energy away from effective growth and eventually causes cell death. The spore spreads so easily that crops can quickly become reinfected. In a study conducted in 2005, cocoa seedlings were inoculated with C. pernithosa spores and in, in visually inspected for 132 days. The biochemical alterations observed were the color change of the green bloom could indicate alterations in plastic metabolism. The vascular tissues were less defined with less defined xylem vessels and a reduction in the ratio of phloem fibers and sieve tubes to phloem parenchyma cells. Reduced photosynthesis with augmented levels of soluble sugars in the infected tissue. Also, hypertrophy is an effect that has been associated with ethylene and other plants. As you can see at the figure, it shows classical symptoms of green and dry bloom in the field, going from mature bloom to partial necrosis, leading to death. So say goodbye to your chocolate. On a mechanistic level, which is broom disease affects the plants by changes in enzymatic activities for not only the plant, but also the fungus. Unfortunately, fungal and host interactions are difficult to differentiate between individual effects. Therefore, the changes are looked at as a whole. Symptoms of which is broom disease are very noticeable and mirror fungal phases. So let's take a look at some of these changes. The first one is ethylene emission. When plant tissues are put under stressful conditions, ethylene levels begin to rise. If you look at the graph, you can see the difference in how many days after infection the levels of ethylene were. They remained constant for a while and then dropped down once tissue died. The second is about carbohydrates, which are determined as a way to determine if there are any high sugar resistance. This phenomenon in plants shows us that there is a defense against pathogens and is determined through examining potential changes in carbohydrates. The graphs on the right represent the difference in defense sugar, co sugar, sugar concentration between multiple days after infection. Interestingly, higher levels of starch in infected tissues may be due to some soluble sugars mobilizing into starch as a way to store extra carbohydrates for the infected plant to hold on to. Changes in sugar and the increase in ethylene levels actually lead to a third change, pigment concentration. High levels of sugar can reduce the need for photosynthesis, which in turn reduces the need for pigment synthesis, and high levels of ethylene is found to degrade chlorophyll. Infected plants have a lighter green color when compared to healthy plants. This change was discovered through an analysis of chlorophylls A and B, carotenoids, xanthophylls. From this, it was determined that the change in pigment came from photosynthetic pigment alterations. Chlorophyll A and B started to drop down. The carotenoids and xanthophylls began dropping down only after 14 days. One of the most significant physical changes that occur is the green boom. This is due to hypertrophic growth that is seen in roots under hypoxic conditions. Additionally, a process known as hyperhydricity is shown. This is found through the observation of hypertrophic growth and the increased water content in tissue cultures from plants that had high ethylene content. The shape of the disease also comes from high ethylene content. Increased ethylene contributes to the epinacity of leaf petioles and stems, giving the green room its shape. Therefore, we can conclude from the mechanisms that were discussed that when the infected plant is put under stress and invasion, ethylene levels rise and continue to increase until tissue death. As a response to these increased ethylene levels, the degradation of chlorophyll occurs, which decreases the plant's color to a lighter green, and the epinacity of the leaf petioles and stems is promoted. Simultaneously, while fighting pathogens and put under stress, another defense mechanism occurs, an increase in sugars. The plant begins to create an overabundance of carbohydrates as a way to hold on to them. Increased sugar gives the plant less of a reason to undergo photosynthesis, which in turn causes the need to, for pigment synthesis to also go down. This adds on to create the lighter green leaf, leaf color. All these mechanisms are done by the plant as a way to try to eliminate the infecting fungus. Unfortunately, these all also lead to death of the infected plant. And then here's our work cited pages. So thanks for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, please ask us. Don't forget to give us a like.